see what the key points are that come out and, uh, and, and make a report. And the report gets uh, published on our website and influences our decision making and, mm -hmm. um, and influences, uh, it gives us some um, data for on which to uh, do advocacy and so on. So thank you very much for participating and welcome. And um, uh, let me just think, oh, the one thing I want to do is um, introduce, okay, you've, you've met Jennifer who's our managing director, and Caitlin, who is now about to wave. There she is. Caitlin Waugh is our uh, database uh, administrator and researcher. So when we talk about any of the technological work that we've done, we just turn directly to Caitlin. She's the one who makes it all work. So uh, thank you. I don't see any other um, board members on the list right now. So I think those are my introductions for now. And I will turn it over to Jennifer, who's going to set us up for uh, just a, a round of introductions. Yes, thank you, Larry. Um, so now, as Larry said, we're going to just go around the room. And um, if you could say a quick, uh, say your name, say the work that you do a little bit, uh, if you are with an organization or if you're an artist educator, uh, just an, uh, an introduction, as well as um, a couple of sentences on the current state of your arts and learning practice and what, uh, what kind of measures you are taking to engage with your students or with your audiences or um, any stakeholders, whether that be uh, mostly online or if you are also still doing some in person. Uh, so just a couple of sentences on, on where you're at right now in your practice. And, uh, and again, um, we hope you're welcome to stay um, just observing. And if you'd like to do that, uh, do leave your, uh, your video off. Um, but uh, if you would like to take part in the conversation, please do turn on your video. And as, Mary, as Larry mentioned, uh, we are recording and we're gonna be posting this conversation on our website afterwards for people if you wanna revisit it or if you, for people who are unable to attend today, who are able to look at it as well. So I'm just going to go down the list here and we'll start with uh, Jane Davis Monroe. Hi, I jumped on a little bit late, so I didn't get the beginning of the conversation, but I'm um, a dance educator um, in at Coxville and Danforth. I've been an educator for 42 years and have had um, a dance studio for the last 34 years. Um, and right now we are totally uh, Zooming our classes. Um, and uh, yeah, that's, that's about it. I don't know what else to offer at this point, but thank you for giving me a voice. Thank you, Jane. And um, another Jane, Jane Deluzio. Hi everyone. Um, I'm here representing the Code, the Council of Ontario Drama and Dance Educators. I'm the current past president and we're the Provincial Subject Association in Ontario to work with um, drama and dance teachers in the public system, grade kindergarten, grades kindergarten to grade 12. Great, welcome. Uh, another Jane, Jane Walmsley. Hi, I'm Jane Walmsley and I'm a board member of Ontario Music Educators Association and we represent um, all music educators in schools, private, public, Catholic across the province and we are supporting our teachers with a number of things. I'm not sure if you want to hear any of that now. Sure. Yeah, just a couple. Of, okay. So um, we had an online conference um, at the beginning of November, and it is continuing with question and answer. Those were all videos uploaded, and now we have question and answer periods about, of about a half an hour, two or three a week. And all of our, our teachers have been able to ask questions specifically to the clinicians. So that's been really great. We're doing pop-up workshops on things that are coming up in our OMEA Facebook potluck, um, issues that teachers are having, uh, teachers that have on our board have done all kinds of different workshops with that. And we have developed quite a few resources that are being posted um, continually on the members only side. 
And um, OMEA did write a, a very large document for COVID-related issues, particularly in music, and um, particularly with singing, with instruments, and um, the ministry did adopt that and used it a great deal. Um, we haven't heard a lot from them since, but that was um, our start with OMEA. So that's what's going on with us. Thanks. That's great. Thank you, Jane. Um, and Barbara. Sorry, Anne, you're muted there. I will try to unmute. Sorry. Oh, you got it. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah. Yes, Anne Barber. I um, I'm an artistic director of Shadowland Theatre, and we do a lot of community engaged programming. I've run a youth program for 26 years in my community, and done over 180 um, projects in schools as an artist in residence over the years. So uh, this has certainly put a damper on many of those activities, and. The youth program I run now, I've been doing on Zoom, but I'd say it's only been partially successful because even though a lot of our work is in puppetry and mask and stuff like that, so there's an element of making, I find the um, engaging with young people in more of the drama side of things, which is what they want to do, has been much more challenging. Um, we do an annual mama's play with, with the youth group and we would just, we were actually meeting, we'd met a couple of times and then the lockdown came. So now we've actually got the kids to, for instance, they, they've all taken photographs of their faces, they're recording their parts um, in audio and we are making 2D puppets of them that we will animate and add their pieces to. So that's a way that we've got around trying to do that kind of performance. But to be honest, I'm interested to hear what people have to say because I'm a bit floundering as to how to run things online and make them really actually satisfactory, meaningful and engaging for especially young people. We are going to be doing hopefully an outdoor program in a park in winter in the in East York. Um, maybe things will be better then in February. I don't know. But uh, yeah, challenging. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Anne. Uh, Carolyn. Hi, everyone. Um, my background is secondary school instrumental vocal and guitar. Um, and now I'm retired, but I'm here representing, uh, like Jane Walmsley, I'm representing the Ontario Music Educators Association. So I won't add anything to what she said. She was pretty thorough. Nice to see you all. Great. Thank you, Carolyn. Um, <clears throat> Jason. Uh, Jason Van Eyck. I'm the manager of music initiatives for the Ezra Lee Foundation. Uh, one of our streams of support in our music arts and culture area is around arts education, especially for disadvantaged children and youth. Um, and as part of that, uh, one of the major projects I'm involved in right now is uh, a research project with the Sistema inspired organizations across Canada. Great. Thank you, Jason. Uh, John. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm John Latiri. Uh, I'm a member of the OMEA, but uh, right now I'm in uh, the uh, situation of, uh, I'm also program manager of Music Alive Festival York Region. And uh, we're in the process of uh, revising and adapting the festival, which has been around serving the community of York Region for over 25 years. And we are going to plan uh, a program of modules to be offered virtually in the new year. Uh, we're in the process right now of updating our website and uh, gathering a team of um, guest artists that would be participating with the delivery of these modules that I have uh, put together. So it will all be virtual. And uh, so it's been a challenge, but uh, we have the support of Character Community of York Region, which is the umbrella organization that Music Alive is operating under. And uh, we also have the support of the York Catholic District School Board and the York Region District School Board 
uh, upper administration to offer something. There is a need in the school system um, that we're, and we realize at Music Alive that uh, we are uh, an important resource for teachers to uh, tap into. Great, thank you, John. Uh, Julian. Just had to take a second to unmute myself there. Hi, I'm Julian Kingston. I take care of the Oakville Museum here in Oakville, Ontario. And the museum is embedded in the recreational culture department here in Oakville. So as part of culture, we work very closely with our culture and our events and our performing arts um, um, uh, uh, outfits to uh, work with community groups and with residents to do all kinds of programming. So. Uh, <laughs> we uh, were closed for most of the of spring and, and the uh, and the summer. We pivoted very quickly to, to doing um, uh, a virtual and online um, offerings. Um, uh, my own background, I've done a fair bit of work in, in kind of virtual uh, programming, um, going back you know more than a dozen years when I was uh, head of education programs at, at the ROM. Uh, the big advantage now is that technology actually works. <laughs> and so we can do things like this without uh, struggling too much. Uh, but really looking ahead, we're looking at, okay, what is the mix of uh, in-person and uh, virtual, in-person where we can and virtual where we uh, should be and need to be uh, uh, doing around our arts and education outreach. Great. Thank you, Julian. Um, Jennifer. Jennifer Welch. Sorry, are you? There you go. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, I am with the Robert McLaughlin Gallery in Oshawa, so I'm on the east end of the GTA, on the other side. Um, we are open still. We opened in June. We've been running um, some virtual programming uh, since it all started. Uh, we jumped pretty quickly as well to um, virtual exhibitions, virtual programming. We have family events that we've done virtually, just trying to keep everyone busy and engaged. Um, right now we're working on our uh, school programming that we're, we're taping live, or not live, sorry, pre-recorded tours uh, and then offering them to the schools and then some live studio workshops as well. We've been doing some live online workshops with some seniors, which is fairly new to us. Uh, which has been very successful. We had one in-person group in before we hit the red zone here in Oshawa. So it was a, a group of special needs, uh, or adults with special needs, sorry, um, with their caretakers. It's only a handful of them, but it was nice to have them back in the, in the building. So it was nice to have that connection again. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Uh, Liz. Hi everyone, um, nice to be here. Uh, I'm coming from Toronto, uh, Treaty 13, Dish With One Spoon territory, uh, original lands of the Mississaugas of the Credit and the Wendat and the Haudenosaunee Confederacy of Six Nations. Um, my name is Liz Pouncet and I am the Drama School Director at Young People's Theatre. Um, in our education department, we have a lot of different things going on right now. Uh, we've been on, the drama school's been online since March. Uh, we sort of pivoted immediately with some of our more advanced uh, teen programs. And then in the summer, we just opened everything up. So we've just been online um, for all ages since July. Uh, and by all ages, I mean toddlers to 18 year olds. Um, and um, that, I'm just sort of one piece of the education. Um, I can also speak somewhat to um, our school programming. We have some online school programming and uh, we also have some live stream theater as well as pre-recorded storytelling um, for engagement for schools and, and audiences. Um, and I think that's, uh, yeah, that's more or less it. Thank you. Great, thank you, welcome. Uh, Marvin. Oh, there we go, I'm un unmuted. Hi, my name is Marvin Karen. I'm the executive director of Shakespeare's Performing Arts, which is a 23 year old charitable nonprofit organization, which started as a 20 school pilot program for the Toronto District School Board 
thanks very much to Jean Deluzio's uh, enormous assistance 23 years ago, getting, getting the organization off the ground. She was just instrumental. We've expanded into a summer program for under-resourced kids, an after-hours program for at-risk youth. And like I'm hearing so many of you say, um, when the school shut down, we were, we were just about, we were in the middle of our rehearsals uh, out of Bernie Custis Secondary School in Hamilton with our after-hours program. And the contact teacher came in and said, the premier has just announced schools will not be reopening uh, for another two weeks after March break. And uh, anyway, so that, that, that whole program went down the, down the tubes, but we did offer a summer program online. Um, since September, we have been going into schools online and we're trying to get to get an, an after hours program off the ground uh, in February. So again, brand new way of doing things. And so far it's working. And again, like I'm hearing some of you say, there are advantages even working through this medium and there are disadvantages. So we just sort of do the best with, uh, with what we've got. So that's my story. Great, thank you. <clears throat> uh, Mathilde? Yes, hi, hello everyone. Uh, thank you, I'm very happy to be here. I'm the uh, executive director assistant for the Canadian music competition. So we were supposed to start our auditions last year in March. And as you can guess, we didn't manage to have our events as we, we usually do because we're all across Canada in all provinces and we need the venues to be open and each province got their own uh, restrictions uh, and each venue's got their own so rules as well. So that's been very challenging. We had to cancel our event last year and turn this into a non-competitive edition. We focused on uh, our pedagogical uh, mission for the young musicians and, uh, you know, they've sent us videos. We organized uh, individual virtual meetings uh, between the musicians and the uh, evaluation committee. Uh, right now for us, we're planning our 2021 edition. It's challenging working on many, many scenarios. So we're prepared for anything that might happen in the coming months. So. You know we're planning and it's a lot of challenges and we are very very busy but we're happy to join the discussion for the Toronto area. Thank you. Uh, Mervy. Hi everyone, I'm Mervy. Um, I'm currently an administrator in the Toronto District School Board but uh, have a long history in arts education. I see lots of familiar faces on the screen there. Um, a uh, past president of the Ontario Art Educators Association. I know some of you from my work when I was at the Ministry of Education as an arts education officer with the curriculum revisions that happened back in 2009. And I see some of you from uh, the UNESCO World Conference uh, on Arts Education in Korea. I think I was the only Canadian elementary representative presenting there. I see some familiar faces there. And uh, I was an arts consultant for a number of years for the Toronto District School Board. So I see familiar faces for that. Jane Deluzio and Jane Walmsley was one of uh, the writers we had uh, with the ministry project when I was an arts officer there. Um, and a CNAL, um, I guess my most recent work with you guys was at the conference that happened in Ottawa where um, I was uh, representing the Toronto Urban Indigenous Education Center which is where I was an administrator uh, until recently. And so lots of familiar faces and lots of different contexts, but now as a school administrator in an elementary school, um, we have been working on how do we do arts with the strict protocols that we need to follow in the city of Toronto, the red zone, lockdown zone, in person, uh, and still be able to do all of these arts. So currently we are still able to run our strings program with uh, having different instruments uh, for different cohorts that are either rested or disinfected between the cohorts. We have a steel pan program we're running as long as the students are not touching the pans and we are disinfecting mallets between them. We are not able to run our band program because we, um, because of the uh, mouthpieces, um, the, the challenges around those pieces. We obviously are not, uh, we are not able to sing. Um, I can't recall if the ban on singing is a, is a local one or if it's a provincial one. 
Um, and in terms of our visual arts, also challenges in terms of that, uh, because we have a beautiful big double visual arts room, which we're not able to use right now because the Rotary teachers, you know, for the most part, move into the homeroom spaces instead of the students going out so to re reduce contact and movement, which adds challenges for our visual arts teacher because everything that he does has to be portable uh, to move into the different homerooms and has to be done so that every student has their own materials. So think about in the past where there would be lots of things in the visual arts room that would be shared. Um, those things can't, we really minimize what is shared. And if something is shared, the students have to sanitize their hands first, use the material, sanitize their hands after, and the materials themselves go into a bin to be sanitized after the class as well. So there's lots and lots of time that has to go into cleaning and disinfecting on a hour by hour basis um, now. Uh, and also we can't do group projects because all our desks are as, uh, as close to two meters apart as possible. Um, teachers have to wear face shields and masks if they are to come closer than two meters to students. If there are situations where students need to touch, we need to use disposable gloves. So you can see there's lots of things that have to be changed to try to maintain a vibrant arts program in a school setting. And our dance and drama programs also are challenged in COVID with um, trying to do as much as we can outdoors uh, be because students, uh, there's a little bit more uh, support in terms of the fresh air aspect of outdoors. Uh, but even then, we're not allowed to, if you, think, if you think of dance, we're not allowed to do anything that would cause students to start to excessively breathe heavily. Because um, if they start to breathe heavily, the risk of the masks being ineffective really increases. So you think about all those kinds of drama activities that we're used to doing with that would require proximity with students. We can't do a lot of those as well. But we are doing our best to try to do um, visual arts, dance, drama, music um, within our context, but uh, still trying to keep everybody safe. And, uh, and it's, a, it's a challenge, but we are doing what we can. Thank you, a challenge indeed, yes. Um, Onika. <clears throat> Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Onika Powell. I'm the artistic director at Vibe Arts. Uh, we've been around for 25 years um, doing arts programming in under-resourced communities around the GTA, um, in Durham, going out to Peel now and up north. Uh, for VIBE, we've been able to pivot and provide online programming, whether that's live um, programming or pre-recorded sessions, art sessions. We have done a couple of um, mural projects in hospitals and community centers that we were able to still continue with um, during that time when COVID first hit. But um, our attention really has been providing virtual programs to our communities. And then as well, uh, the second part of Vibe Arts, we provide mentorship to emerging artists coming from these communities. So that's been a big focus for us for the last couple of months. It's just providing online professional development workshops for them, um, providing them with funds to create art during this time. Um, and then just looking for ways that they could exhibit, uh, whether that's online virtually or hopefully in the new year um, in person. But yeah, that's where we are. I'm glad to be here. A lot of new faces for me. So it's always good to hear what everyone's doing and network and connect and see how we could collaborate. Great, thank you. Uh, Phoenix. <clears throat> Hello everyone, um, I'm Phoenix. Um, some know me as Sun. Uh, I am from Jane and Finch, that's home. I'm currently uh, reporting to you from Atlanta, Georgia in the States. Um, in terms of GTA related stuff, I'm actually doing a project right now um, 
with STEPS and, uh, and start Street Art Toronto as the community engagement and inclusion consultant on some of their mural, on a mural project that they're doing in the community. Um, but I myself in like my core role, I'm director of Voice of Purpose. Um, and we are currently running a research project that was funded by the Digital Strategy Fund to look at um, what are the needs of artists in uh, digital learning environments. Um, at Voice of Purpose, we focus around like professional development, specifically for artist educators. Um, and uh, so in this research project, it's uh, going across Canada and the US, uh, looking at several different regions and connecting um, through surveys and, and roundtables and, and uh, community conversations and things like that. So um, I do actually have to hop off very shortly because I have to support a, a dance program that's happening at 1.30. Um, but I just wanted to hop in and just let people know that this is a resource for you if you want to get connected to what we're doing. I'll put a description in the chat for those who get involved with the, um, the research will also receive all the findings of the research. So that's part of the benefit as well. So um, sending you all an amazing day. Thank you for having, holding these conversations again, Jennifer and Larry. I'll see you tomorrow. No, Monday. I'll see you Monday. <laughs> I've, I've signed up for all the conversations, just so you know, if you're going to any other ones, you'll see me there. Thanks. Thanks, Phoenix. Yes, and please do go ahead and uh, post anything in the chat and anyone else as well. If you have links or want to share any resources, uh, please do post them in the chat and uh, we will likely make use of them um, and share them later on as well. Um, Sheila. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I am a high school teacher uh, with the Toronto Catholic District School Board. And I'm in a, I guess what we call a hybrid situation where uh, there's two cohorts. Uh, so I see my classes every other day. And then in the afternoon, um, we have online. So um, I've been teaching now, I'm going into my 30th year. So I find since March, I've been in a sort of a constant state of just learning, uh, learning technology. Um, but as we've moved into the new school year, my uh, experience has changed somewhat into rethinking what performance is um, and, uh, and that shared lived experience of performance. Uh, and for so long in my, in my teaching work, uh, all of those things that you sort of took for granted um, with the, the drama games, now you have to reimagine those to incorporate the physical distancing. Um, even the way the students enter my class um, has changed. So just re-imagining uh, the, the possibilities. Uh, so it, the drama classroom is a place where things change and move so, and, and now incorporating the frame of the Zoom box, you know, just, uh, uh, it's been for me just a constant reimagining and revisioning of what we do essentially. Um, so I'm starting to see opportunities and possibilities and it's still difficult, it's still challenging. Normally I, I would focus much more on group work and that working towards um, performance now I'm moving more into having to do more like, for example, monologue work to allow for the students in that virtual space as well. Um, so a lot of learning, um, uh, trying to meet the challenges, but again, to sh sort of trying to shift that um, perspective. My experience as a high school drama teacher was always, you know, limitations were opportunities for creativity. So I think I'm going back now after um, managing the overwhelm of the first few weeks from March, now just trying to approach the work uh, as, as to what are the possibilities. And uh, also I have learned a lot from my students who uh, uh, in their expertise. So that's been a shift for me as well. Uh, our students are, are, some of them are very adept, you know, in the TikTok and, and their idea of performance. So I'm learning that as well. So it's uh, still a very transitional uh, felt experience for me, but it's moved away from feeling overwhelmed to seeing possibility. 
Great, thank you, Sheila. Um, Tamara. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Tamara Romanchuk. I'm the artistic director of Clay and Paper Theater, and we've been the resident theater company of Dufferin Grove Park for 26 years. Uh, very much uh, um, uh, uh, doing similar work to uh, Ann Barber in Shadowland, um, in that we use puppetry uh, quite often, or you know, images in public space. Um, and uh, our particular specialty is is big images and. and uh, giant puppetry in public space, uh, storytelling uh, uh, through plays and pageants and parades. And so our, we're, uh, we're a theater company, but we also do a lot of community engagement work as well. And our work, uh, we specifically choose public space because we hope, um, you know, it presents less barriers for, uh, for individuals, whether it's children to older adults to accessing uh, arts experiences and having art in their everyday lives in their own public spaces in their own parks. Um, so yeah, we've had a lot of challenges too. And uh, uh, ours is a very, uh, is very much a drop in experiential type of uh, open studio workshop uh, experience. Um, and, but we're also, you know, we, we, we had to make some, we need, had to do some quick rethinking of things in the summer and we happened to have, have had at that time some funding from Animating Tro Parks Toronto through Toronto Arts Council, uh, an ongoing funding source to do performances in parks. And we took that money. Instead, we were all able to sort of uh, adapt to COVID and what we needed to do and did a virtual project which was a huge learning for us and, and an exciting, we thought it a, a huge success. We knew that we needed um, uh, digital uh, backup. So we actually had one of our alumni who was back in school, who happened to be finishing her second year in digital arts, come and work with us and create a website. We happened to have had an amazing producer inter, intern whose partner was a, uh, 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 an educator in theater uh, in the Toronto District School Board uh, who came in as a consultant. So we really pulled the specialists that we needed into the project making and created something called the Third Eye. It was an um, uh, experience, a virtual community experience in, in storytelling. And uh, so that website exists. It's not, doesn't exist right now for completely asynchronous learning, uh, but um, uh, we, we were able to adapt what we think is important to community engagement, which is relationship building. And for us doing that through material arts. And so we, I loved what you talked about Sheila and, and thinking, rethinking, how do we do theater, uh, in this space? And so we really ran with it. We, uh, you know, like a lot of artists, we steal ideas. And we were really inspired by our colleagues and friends at Great Small Works in uh, New York who do toy theater and paper theater. And the thing that struck us about that was we had, like many people, I'm sure, like many of you, were watching things earlier on in the pandemic and weren't that excited about stuff on screen, weren't seeing it translating well. Well, paper theater, toy theater, it's filmic, it's image-based. And so we knew we had now a format, a tool that we could work with to use that to build relationships and to, you know, hopefully answer some issues around isolation for, for community members. So we're very proud of that project. Tremendous learning, which, um, you know, we'd love to share with people. Uh, we just kind of compiled a, just all the raw information for, I guess, a case study for ourselves. Um, but now I find where I'm frustrated is any sort of emergency COVID money that grantors are offering right now are focused on research and development. We've done the research and development. We'd like to pay more artist facilitators so that we could offer that program to, to more people. So that's kind of where I, where my frustration lies, but I'm very excited to hear, like I, I thought I really connected to what you were saying, Sheila. Excellent, thank you. <clears throat> Tara. 
Hi, everyone. I'm Tara Burt. I'm the um, coordinator of arts education, kindergarten to grade 12 in the Peel District School Board. Um, I've newly returned to this role. I've just finished a, a, a vice principal position in a, in a school for the first quadmester and am happily back now in my arts uh, coordinator position. And um, But what a time. And um, I, I must say, I'm quite heartened to see and hear see your faces and, and thankful to the CNAL for giving us this opportunity to have this roundtable discussion and network like this. And, and like I said, I'm heartened to see some of the programming that's continuing because I know you've really had to pivot and you've had to reinvent and redefine what arts uh, performance and uh, pedagogy even looks like right now. Uh, in the Peel District School Board, um, as of today, we have 160 classrooms that are closed. More than 50% of our students are participating online. And we've just started in quadmester two with something called the hybrid model, which means that teachers are teaching both students in the classroom at the same time simultaneously as the students online in the same class. And they're trying, they're basically, uh, they've become media producers, all the teachers. Uh, trying to position themselves so that um, the the camera that they're utilizing to instruct and direct and uh, engage the students as equitably as possible in the delivery of the programming is uh, positioned um, that they are able to interact with both the students in the space safely as well as the students online and still try to create collaborative, creative um, exploratory arts classrooms. So it's really quite the undertaking. And um, I am looking for opportunities, more opportunities. We're already working with a few theater companies like Studio 180. Um, I, I'm looking for more opportunities to bring in guest artists to work on play development with dramatic arts students, um, to work with dance uh, artists and uh, look at what choreography can look like when you have to use a camera and you've got to work very much in solo or, or um, you know, collaborate in terms of duets or small groups, but that you're not actually in the same space. Uh, the flexibility of working outdoors, the adjustment in attire and um, outfitting. Um, as well as trying to deliver music programs that are non-instrumental because many of the band programs have been shelved because we don't have an equitable way to ensure that every student online has an instrument in their home that has either been borrowed from the school or rented from one of the music uh, companies. So there's a lot of percussion, a lot of body percussion, a lot of found instruments, found art um, materials, in order to try and um, equitably provide this learning to all of the students. Uh, at the same time as really uh, our, our board has had um, a major review and we are under supervision of the Ministry of Education right now for concerns around racism in, um, in the curriculum, in, in, the, uh, in the board itself and the structures of the board, systemic racism. So there's a, a major overhaul in terms of looking at the curriculum and being culturally responsive, um, providing opportunity to student voice and really respecting all of the um, lived experiences of all the students within the classroom and shifting away from what has been very traditional Eurocentric westernized um, ways of knowing and ways of understanding arts uh, culturally and, um, and performatively. So we're juggling, we're all juggling. Um, and sometimes in that kind of uh, challenging climate and with these challenging forums, we also see unbelievable creativity and uh, innovation. So there's some very inspiring work happening as well. So I think my job right now as a coordinator is to, uh, to make sure that the educators are all connected with the community supports and that's you and, um, and to provide these opportunities to students that now that we are so much online and so much connected digitally to the, to the um, communities outside of the school, how can we actually create opportunities for students that they might not have otherwise had? Fantastic, thank you, Tara. And um, Annie. I'm very new to this 
form, uh, in fact, I'm very new to music world. Um, so I currently have two roles. Uh, one is I'm, um, I'm the president of the board of directors of Canadian Music Competition. Uh, Matilda, we're just uh, representing the national, I'm representing the Toronto region. Uh, so that's a nonprofit organization. Um, and my other role is I'm a co-founder of Cana uh, Canada uh, Academy of Music and Arts. It's a music school, very, very new group. Um, so from the Canadian music competition perspective, um, we what we usually do is um, on an annual basis, we have a lot of like uh, uh, concerts, um, mainly uh, like have the uh, Canadian music competition winners as the performers and to, uh, you know, like just inspire our uh, young musicians and the people who are interested to music. Uh, but unfortunately, during this pandemic, all the concerts that we initially scheduled already for year 2020 all get canceled. Uh, we do keep um, a good relationship with our sponsors, you know, our uh, kids, our CMC kids. Um, but unfortunately, not much events have been occurred. Uh, we did think about whether we should do online concert as everybody else did. Um, I participated a few uh, virtual concert and I found that the, the sound quality is really questionable. And it's also very much depend on the kids, the facility at the kids' home. It's not only the piano or you know the string, but also uh, you know the, the, the microphone, all the setup. It's, it's just, it just, and I'm afraid that a lot of our kids, they're really great performers. And I'm afraid that the, the virtual version is gonna lower the quality that it sounds like. So we then decided that for the CMC Toronto region, we will not do any online concert. And hopefully in 2021, things could change. Now for, um, for uh, my music school, uh, we have about 200 students. Um, we now stop all um, like, like all the group classes, they all go to um, like online classes. And so we only do some uh, music theory um, studies, but, and then we don't do any wing. So right now only strings and the piano. And for this specific situation, unfortunately we have to buy two piano for every room um, that we go. And luckily is initially when we designed the school, we designed it uh, in a, you know, like to, for chamber, uh, for a lot of chamber purpose. So a lot of room are big for chamber. So now we shut down all the, initially planned for private instrument room. Uh, we only use those chamber room and then shipping the two piano so that kids can keep social distance with mask on and all that. But um, I agree um, that it's definitely a lot of work in terms of sanitizing because it's like in between kids. And then also we have a very uh, nine pages of COVID-19 handbook. And so every kids engaged, they would have to read and sign and a lot of time we need to walk through it. So um, it, it also requires, you know, like a, the, the, the kind of like a routine that everybody are familiar with, you know, like a one door in, one door all out. And uh, so it's a lot of work, but um, we, we have everybody do online classes from March to August. Everybody has to do virtual class. We didn't do um, online. To be true, it is better than you don't take any classes because we do see our students, uh, they, they kind of, uh, put behind after stopping their classes for a while. But compared to live class, the, the efficiency is, uh, is a lot worse. So we decided in September, we want to start one-on-one, uh, -on -one, of course, only one-on-one. -on -one. Um, and we found the students are very, very happy as long as we follow very strict protocols. Um, so that's what we are currently doing. Um, the students are, um, I think they're progressing very well. Um, and the other very big change is uh, um, me and my uh, co-founder with my partner, we both are learning technology so much. Uh, so we are, we are constantly visiting all kinds of, like even my, my room here, I have three microphones here, um, like in the school as well, like we now have like all these control boards because our kids need to go online concerts or they need to do recording. And it's such a painful thing when you hear such a great, Play and then when you hear from online, it's uh, very torture. So we all start to learn uh, a lot of new things. 
But I think on one side it's for sure very difficult for all of us, but on the other side I do feel, we do feel, that it also opens a lot of doors because our kids are still be able to see a lot of on online concerts. So yeah, so that's uh, basic, basically from what, what uh, yeah, my role and my work. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Annie. Um, <clears throat> great. Well, what an interesting cross section of uh, the art sector. So many different uh, perspectives, and exciting to have so many um, people who are working in schools, school administrators, and, and school teachers as well here. So it's a really uh, exciting cross section. I'm going to throw it back to Larry, who will uh, go to uh, the next question here. Yes. Thank you very much. Um, so the, my question, uh, my favorite question is coming up now. Um, I, I, I do believe you all have a crystal ball located just underneath the table at which you're sitting. And I'd like you to bring it out now, please, because my question is about the future. Um, and it really, it touches on, uh, who, was, who was talking about what? Um, Julian maybe was talking about, you know, what it's going to be like later, um, what happens, do we do, do we continue using this technology? Uh, are we all going to go, oh, thank God. When, you know, when, when we finally get some, get a handle on COVID, um, uh, then do we throw up, throw out everything we've been doing and say, now we go back to the real stuff or has reality changed? Is there a new reality? And what, what do you see it might be? So what can you imagine in your particular field, happening or being the situation after the pandemic or after this big wave of the pandemic? What, what is arts and learning going to look like in the future? How's that? Great, and I should mention also that I'm, if you pull up the participants uh, window and you can see participants at the bottom there, then you have the opportunity to kind of virtually raise your hand, which makes it a little bit easier to uh, to call on people. Um, but uh, but you can also just wave me down if you're having trouble with that as well. So anyone wanna start off the conversation about what, uh, what you'll be doing in the future? Yes, Annie, and also Annie, I can hear you, but it is a very, very low. So uh, just to let you know that oh, okay. the microphone's a bit low. Okay, is it better? No. no. Oh. oh, okay. You see that piece of technology? There we go. Yay. <laughs> okay, so yeah. I know why, because I didn't, I forgot. I was connected with all my microphone that is connected to my piano and I was far away from all those uh. microphone. Yeah, because uh, my son has been constantly doing all these recordings and stuff. Um, so sorry uh, if you didn't hear any of the stuff that I said before. Yeah, so um, I, I think that's, again, I'm very, very new to music world. Um, so from my observation, I think it, it might be a combination. There are parts that that might be extended. So for example, um, in the past, my son has to fly all over the world to participate master classes. And it's a very painful process because you need to always uh, get away from school and a lot of things and costs and a lot of things. But now it's so convenient. You get this access to the best musicians all over the world. And of course, in-person classes with them is the best choice. But if compared to, you know, you don't even have access and now you have all these access and this is absolutely a great advantage for this new world. But I do observe there are things that is never gonna be replaceable. For example, um, my son was asked to do online concert all the time. And then one day uh, he was asked to go uh, uh, on site a, a concert. There are very limited uh, uh, like audience but still it's an uh, on-site one. So he was very excited, but I found that uh, he, he all of a sudden he get like so nervous, he, he, he couldn't do it. Like I'm talking about a kid doing this concerts like 50 concerts a year, all of a sudden he feel he couldn't do it, even though he is do, constantly doing all these virtual concerts. And then the other thing is me as, a, as an audience, I don't know how to say, it, but when I'm, participating in all these virtual concert, it doesn't touch me as much as it used to do. It, it, and I think that part 
it's not going to be replaced neither from the performer perspective nor from the audience perspective but from a learning perspective i do feel that there are more opportunities more possibilities in this new world in the past i found that those masters like musicians they don't they, they don't know technology right and then it, it would be impossible you ask oh can i have an online class with you but now almost all the musicians are learning it and so it become a possibility you ask that and i said yeah sure and let me check my schedule so this is really a positive side that i see i think this is from a more music side um, I, I think that would be a, a slight change on the, all the performance and the, that events, that perspective. Yeah, thank Great. you. Great, thank you, Annie. Uh, Julian. All right, just let me unmute myself. Let me publicly apologize for the gibberish I was putting in the chat. But I, was, I was trying to type on my phone while I was on a stand and every time I edited it, it moved. <laughs> it was just like nonsense coming out of it. Anyway, I've now switched to my laptop, so it's a little more stable. Um, yeah, I just wanted to kind of speak, to, I guess, maybe a little bit of a continuation as to what I was doing before. And I'm curious, I guess, particularly from people who are on the theater side, but I think it, it applies to performance or art instruction as well. If anyone's really experimenting with uh, like more immersive technologies, like with uh, 360 or 180 VR or 3D, uh, certainly it's something that we're looking at, that I'm looking at. I mean, from my background on the museum side, uh, we're kind of always looking at like, you know, the hands-on immersive, the real person stuff always works so much better than what we ever tried to do on the digital side. And there's always this dichotomy between the two, you know, it was one or the other. And so for a long time, I've been trying to work on, well, how do you get those to be the greater, you know, greater than the sum of its parts? Um, and I don't think you ever replace that in-person experience, but right now we've got a lot of, it's a good opportunity. It's, it's, there's a lot of momentum um, because now the technology works, it's much more accessible. Um, but the, uh, you know, if we're talking about school programs, um, you know, their teachers in the classrooms are much more comfortable with bringing the tech technology in and turning it on. And there's a real hunger for content, right? So I'd be really interested to hear, um, like, have people start to experiment with some of that stuff? Um, what are they doing? Are they planning on it? Um, you know, because I do think like, we're not gonna see school groups in person here in the next school year. Like we're not gonna see them this school year for sure. And we probably won't see them in 2021. So if we're not doing something more immersive that reaches out, then we're not really doing our job. Yes, thank you, Julian. And yes, we're um, <clears throat> should mention that we're also developing a series of webinars and are looking to know what it is that you want to explore a little bit more. So that kind of technology would be something that we would be looking at potentially um, having some professional development webinars on as well, but interested to hear what platforms you're using and what you're looking to use. Uh, so yeah, just uh, include that if you are able to. Uh, Onika. Yeah, I'm putting my money where my mouth is here because yeah. I'm uh, uh, hooked up with uh, um, Dave over at uh, Shakespeare in Action. <laughs> We're going to try some stuff together. So we'll see if, uh, uh, you know, I don't really have a theater outlet directly here from the museum, but he does. So we're going to try some stuff, experiment. Oh, great. Well, keep us posted. Thanks. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> yeah, Onika. Yes, um, I think it's a very important question of what the future looks like. Uh, I think the answer differs depending on what your what your community, what your customers, what they look like. Um, for Vibe Arts, I think the bigger question for us is accessibility um, with the pandemic, especially with you know everything that's happening with the Black Lives Matter movement, um, with the Indigenous community. It's raised a lot of um, awareness of the inaccessibilities to a lot of programming and stuff like that. So for us, it's it puts a lot of pressure on how do you be innovative with delivering programs? Um, yes, virtually doing stuff online, it's good. We actually do have a higher percentage of attendance um, for our emerging artists coming and doing say like a PD workshop and stuff like that. Cause then you break down the barriers of having to commute somewhere or finding a sitter to watch their child. But then on the flip side for programming, if those families don't have internet, like what are we doing to provide arts programming? So like 
one of our recent programs has been like buying iPads, but downloading the actual program onto the iPads. So it eliminates that, you know, not having internet. But I think for the future, I would like to see a little bit of, you know, each, but more just making sure that um, things are equitable, like there's access for everybody. <clears throat> Thank you. Liz. Um, I, much like Onika, what you're describing, um, accessibility has been a big part of young know, people's theaters program development over the decade, the last decade. Um, and when I think of, well, I'm imagining this is over next summer. Um, that's what I'm imagining the future is. Um, um, I mean, I know we're going to be online almost certainly until next July. Um, but beyond that, uh, our experience has been quite positive online. But what we think a lot about is the reality that theater fundamentally is a, a live shared experience, which you can't have online. Um, so I do look to going back to that. But the exciting discoveries that we're having um, are that drama, as opposed to theater, uh, works online. Um, and I mean, theater works online too, but in terms of education and teaching and, and um, in interacting with students, um, it's, it's working quite well. Um, and just this morning, I was talking with one of our teachers who teaches JKSK online, um, that she's discovered that her kids are actually making faster progress online. Um, and so, you know, I kind of wish we were researching ourselves, but just, you know, to paying a little bit more focused attention to how it's going. Um, but sort of anecdotally, as I got from someone, anecdotally speaking, um, we are, we're finding that there's actual pedagogical benefits to being online that I was not anticipating. Um, so past July, you know, into next fall, um, I think there's two reasons why we would consider having some sort of online activity if we can manage the workload, because let's be frank, it is far more work um, teaching online. And it's also more exhausting uh, teaching and administering online. Um, if we can manage it, I, I would see that there's potentially a benefit pedagogically for some age, age ranges. Um, but like Onika is saying, in terms of accessibility, um, because we're having kids that don't have bus fare that can now come online because they don't have to come down to YPT or one of our locations. Um, um, but, you know, conversely, if you don't have a device, then you can't get online. So um, I, I think this is a, uh, I think this is something that we'll consider in the future for those two reasons. Um, but the last point I'll say, you know, as someone who's now watched a lot of kids work online, there's massive uh, community building benefits to it, um, just in terms of mental health and, and creative expression. Um, but the fascinating other reality is they're not actually learning how to be in person with people. Um, so at the same time, they're finding community, they're not actually practicing their social skills. And I know that sounds contradictory, um, but I'm very interested to see how, uh, you know, we can support each other moving forward so that, you know, maybe I've got kids coming to me from some area that can't get to downtown Toronto come fall 2021 but one of you has a program that could you know support you know like I so I feel just coming to one of your questions in your about the directory like I feel like there's you know maybe this is going to bring us together in an interesting way because we're meeting students we're meeting each other's students um, and you know how can we sort of go back to being in person um, you know maybe not to me but maybe to, to one of you guys because um, I think that's critical. <laughs> right. Thank you, Liz. Mathilde. <clears throat> yes, thank you. Um, as somebody said, it's it's so different depending on what you work with. We are 
a Canadian competition, a music competition, we are known to have um, standards. And it's, it's so being totally virtual, being a competition, you know, we're giving prices away and scholarships. We need to be sure that we can compare um, the musicians uh, equally, but there's also all the equity aspect that is very important. Not everybody's got a grand piano in their home or, you know, the material to be recorded. So for us, with our activity, it's so important for us that in the future, we can go back to a certain normal because we need the venues and, you know, to have all of this material, uh, those instruments for the young musicians. But I'm also happy to hear that some of you um, have found some learning opportunities in being online. And we at the Canadian Music Competition, we really experienced that last year, um, going from a competition to a non-competitive um, activity. You know, we didn't give scholarships away, but we didn't want um, having nothing to offer to the musicians who had been rehearsing for a while, you know. So we did something online and we organized um, individual uh, virtual meetings. As I've said before, we organized over 550 over a few weeks. And we found that the musicians actually had time to prepare their questions and what they wanted to ask um, the, the jurors. And most of them, you know, didn't talk at all about their performance. They actually were asking, oh, like um, carrier devices or what should I do next? And it, it happened to be like really deep conversations that usually would not be observing the other years because, you know, would be like a quick chat uh, just after the performance. So we found that really interesting. And, you know, as somebody said, there was a momentum and, and we took it. So, you know, there's a little bit of both. Like we, we do think it's important for the musicians like to perform and have an audience. I don't play myself, but I miss going to a concert so much. <laughs> I would be very happy that if we could do that again, but yeah, no, it's, it's very interesting to hear all your point of view on that. Thank you. Uh, Tamara. So the future, oh, uh, that's a big question. Um, I think that to some degree, we will try and incorporate some of the digital experiences and lessons that we have learned because we've also seen the advantage of certain advantages online. Um, uh, with our third eye project, what was quite interesting uh, was, you know, you, you had single people, uh, you know, on their own in their apartments, joining uh, the, the workshops, you had families deciding as a family that they would do the workshop together, a family of four, and uh, or maybe a family of four, but one of them was reluctant, and by the end, they were not. And so it was interesting to hear the feedback from parents about the process with their own children, just sort of touching back on what Liz was talking about, um, just how quickly uh, and how impactful the work was um, digitally. Uh, but they were, it was quite interesting to see that they were working within a unit as well in their own home. Um, so while we were doing a virtual workshop, they were not completely isolated but the people who were isolated, again, to be able to work together and to have more coaching and opportunities to build those relationships and talk and talk about storytelling um, had a huge impact. Uh, but we work in public space and, that, and we make that choice because we want to uh, make art as accessible as, as, as we possibly can. So yeah, there are definitely restrictions uh, to, um, they're definitely inequitable um, uh, access to, to those tools. So, um, but I can see us taking certain elements of our work and doing certain elements online that people can then bring to a live event. You know, if we're talking about the, the, the future time, um, how we might use that. Um, and uh, for, for us going into the future, uh, you know, I think the, the work that we developed online will still be a backup for us. We don't have the resources to maintain both the live and the digital aspects to the work. 
Uh, but as I said, I can see incorporating some of the, the digital elements in the future. But going forward, for us, it's we've decided the safest things are either spectacle or much more one-on-one -on -one individualized performance options, like something we have called Cyclops Cycling Oriented Puppet Squad, where there are, there are only two performers and a bike, and the show comes out of a, um, of a trailer. Um, so then performances are more from sidewalk to homes, sidewalks to lower balconies, sidewalks to, you know, seniors' homes, um, something that we're still taking very much into account people's bubbles and decreasing contact. Um, but for spectacle, if we can continue to do parade uh, performances, then perhaps we'll use, uh, like we've been talking about this using uh, digital online workshops for the community to create elements and to still watch the parade, but they'll have certain elements that contribute to the parade images. So that's, that's what we've been thinking about. Okay, great, thank you. Um, Jane <clears throat> Deluzio. Sorry, hi. Um, I think when I imagine the, the future of it all, uh, and then listening to what everybody's saying when they're speaking, it's very much a sense of polarities and when at, that are happening. So the equity issues are massive. And yet, once you have access to the internet, you have a much larger, grander, more equitable community because everybody can come from anywhere. Um, I think back to the concept of the highway originally was built by the rich for the rich and everyone else had to go on paths uh, to get where they were going and was difficult for travel until the community decided it would pay for roads. It had to become a community thing to pay for roads. And I think we're going to have to step up and do that with internet as well. Are we going to continue as a globe that needs to connect across the world for us to, to work as, as global citizens? Are we going to expect everybody to have to pay individually? Or are we going to find a way for it to be something that is community paid for, that everybody in a community has access to the internet, that it should be the international highway, I guess, so to speak. Um, because it's massive. If we're going to go into a digital age, we've got to make sure everybody's digitally connected. Otherwise, we create elite communities again. And, and, and not that we ever stopped creating elite communities. So I think that's critical to when we're talking about all this, because we're talking about those of us who are able to successfully do this kind of communication or do our art on the internet. So that was one point I, I wanted to, to think about. Um, the other one I wanted, I just made a couple notes. So the other one mainly was that as we re sort of frame community into an international community more and more and more, and then we have to go right down to that one person that we're communicating with uh, in a classroom or in an art experience. Um, so I think when we do those one-on-ones, we, we can help certain in, individuals. Um, I, I don't know what pedagogy, I'd love to hear uh, Tamara, uh, it's Tamara, right, from YPT? Emma, have I got my name? No, Liz, Liz. from YPT, Liz. sorry Liz. Liz okay. from YPT, hi. Um, uh, I, I don't know what pedagogy is better, to be honest. I know lots of other things are more interesting, but that's a discussion another time outside. I'd like to find out. Certainly the better our teachers get uh, at finding, and boy, artists and teachers, drama, dance, music, we're all so creative. We find creative solutions to the problem. So we find ways to put people in little groups. We find ways to adapt games. We find ways to put kids in role meaningfully somehow when we're not in the same place to find a way for them to speak meaningfully to one another from two different parts of the city on screen uh, to, to explore a character. But I also think that we have to be very, very, very aware, sharply aware, and that's the last point I want to make, that politically 
everything in the end still seems to be about monetization. And that's a reality we all need because if we don't have a salary, if we don't have a way to make a money, if we to live, we have to be monetized. That's still essential. But if we monetize learning, if we make it be that what's less expensive to that's the way we teach, I think that's a not good vision for the future. So I just wanted to throw all those random ideas. It's not very cohesive, but so many good in point, input and then your head goes poof and you have lots of different ideas that come in. So that's enough for now. Thank you, Jane. Um, yes, Anne. Hi. Um, yeah, I'm certainly concerned about the equity thing. Uh, we work with rural communities and in underserved communities. And I think the um, trying to recreate a sense of awe and wonder that you get through performance or seeing live stuff is a challenge. And one of the things that um, we had a, a very successful project, again, it was a big experiment in the summer, which we called the Homoji project, which was because everybody had been isolated at home, they all had feelings about what home meant to them. So we asked a community to create an, a 2D, 2D or 3D image of their home. And then we installed them outside in a park that people could then come to and see everybody's contributions. Um, and then we did, we ended up doing a bit of a performance just because it so happened that that day they opened it up that you were allowed to have 100 people gather outside. We're going to do a similar thing in a park in East York in the winter where we're going to send kits or do an online workshop with people, but then get them so that would be in lantern making and then get them to come to the park and install their pieces with some grander pieces that we're taking so that then there's that collective or that they can see by their contribution and clearly there's an element of, of physical presence um, but the idea is to make it big enough that people aren't you know can easily social distance or it can be seen from apartment balconies or from across the park or whatever so you design something that will have impact from a distance and, but it still requires that element of engagement. I mean, there's a wonderful organization in Halifax called Wonderneath, and they've been giving out weekly packets in brown paper bags with an art project in it. And literally they open the door, somebody puts their hand out and they get, they get the kit, they make something, they take a photograph, it, they send it back. Um, so that that's certainly a way of helping people keep their hands busy and, and making things, which I think is important. But one of the elements I think Anika mentioned, um, Liz, I think mentioned also, is it's not just about learning about art. It's not learning how to make things or dance or sing or play music. There's so much about the, the social skills and interacting with people that aren't yourself, that aren't only in your small family or small community or group that you're a bubble that you're allowed to be in. Um, and yes, and I think people have mentioned that online you can reach to many, many other communities, but you don't do that practicing of the social skills. And I'm kind of concerned about that element and how we can online create experiences that kind of uh, nurture some of that getting to know people, getting to empathize with each other, getting to see different points of view that happens kind of automatically when you're doing theater and drama and, you know, all papier mashing a giant puppet head or whatever. Um, so that is an area that I'm thinking about and sorry, my crystal ball doesn't tell me exactly how that's going to go, except that I'm kind of interested to see how this idea of doing small projects, crafting things, having instruction, and then having a giant scale installation so they get that collective awe sense how that's going to work. Thank you. Uh, we'll do Jane Walmsley and then we'll move on to the next section after that. Jane. Thanks. From, um... Ontario music educators and in, in dialoguing with our teachers right now, there is also a huge fear 
um, going forward that there is going to be this this sense that because we made it happen for our kids online that that's going to be okay um, that the dollars won't flow into into music any longer and there is no need for instruments and it's already been mentioned about the um, coming together socially and the interdependence that music is and so many of the arts are it's really key for our students to have those experiences so Ontario music educators are really um, concerned about going for what people think now can can just be can happen online d distance learning rather than face to face so that our, our teachers are starting to really express that thanks thank you thank you um, so many of you have mentioned about uh, the making connections online and um, connections with each other, connections with the public, and um, and so it kind of we're introducing our next part, which is about the map. And I know um, uh, you all should have received the email that had some uh, links to the map. Not sure if you had a chance to explore it, but I'm going to pass it over to Caitlin, who's going to do a, a brief tour of the map and. Amazing. Yeah, thank you. Um, so yeah, if you had a chance to check out the map, uh, that great. If not, I'll take you on a brief little tour of it. So I'll share my screen with you all here now. Um, so yeah, here's here's Canada's map of arts and learning. It's been um, growing for the past four years now. Uh, we have over almost 9,000 uh, contacts, organizations, artists, educators represented across Canada. Um, it is, it is a free resource available on our website under Canada's Map of Arts and Learning right here. Um, we are obviously, I'm really hopeful that it is a usable uh, tool for you and that you have issues using it. And I'm always looking for user feedback on your experience using it. Um, it is searchable for by arts uh, discipline as well as whether you're looking for artist educators or um, arts organizations who offer community-based programming. So that might be things like workshops, uh, group classes, uh, performances, as well as organizations and artist educators who offer programming specifically for schools. Um, so whether that's like bringing an artist into the classroom or organizations sometimes offer uh, professional development for staff, uh, performances, field trips, workshops, et cetera. So you can filter by exactly what you're kind of programming you're looking for, be it for something for yourself, for your, for your kids, um, or for a classroom. Um, you can also check out schools only at, across Canada and see what's happening, arts programming in those schools. Um, those are not quite as like thorough because they are so, have to be self-reported. But nonetheless, um, there's a lot of really good data that we have about the arts programming that's happening in schools. Um, any artist educator or arts organization that offers some kind of programming can apply to appear on the map. You, you can do so by just clicking on the get on the map link right here and there's a profile form you can fill out and you get approved and you're on the map. Um, so we have a couple profile examples that I'm going to show you that are, you can basically make your profile look like this or if you want, make it with photos, uh, some information about yourself. Um, so this is an example of an artist educator uh, who works in schools and she also does uh, like community stuff in the community performances. Um, so you have the option of indicating exactly which arts disciplines you work in, exactly what kind of services you offer. Um, so in this case, uh, she does partnerships with artist educators, uh, residencies in schools, workshops. Um, and because we're a networking organization, we obviously want to show the relationships that exist in communities between uh, individual artist educators and the organizations they work with. So in this case, this artist educator is affiliated with Vibe Arts, so which works well because we actually have someone from the organization <laughs> on our call today. Um, and additionally, if you're an artist educator or an organization and you kind of want to give an idea of the type of programming that you actually offer, um, you can create a featured project. And so in this case, this is a, um, a performance uh, that was 
funded basically and so it kind of gives an idea of if someone wants to bring you into their classroom or into your, their community like this is the kind of programming that you can facilitate for them so future projects give a really good idea of the type of work you're doing so then if we go to vibe arts um, her community partner um, same idea for a um, an organization as for an artist educator uh, we also now illustrate who offers online programming um, because this has obviously become a lot more um, important in this recent time. So this organization does offer online programming, uh, the type of programming they offer to schools and the types of programming that they offer in the community. And same idea, their par partners, artists, educators who exist in the community who are affiliated with Vibe Arts. Um, and finally, I did talk a little bit about school profiles and the types of things that we can show on the map about schools across Canada, public or private schools. Um, our profiles show exactly what kind of uh, resources are being put into uh, arts programming in schools. So be it like the number of minutes of arts programming, uh, whether they have community arts partners. Um, so arts pro partner programs often include like field trips and resources um, and that sort of thing, the kind of activities that schools are doing in the arts. Um, and again, this showing the relationships that exist in communities between organizations, educators, and schools. Uh, this particular school has partner programs with both the Art Gallery of Windsor as well as the Windsor Symphony Orchestra. Um, so that's it for like profiles, but also I did mention that we also are now showing who offers online uh, programming. And so in the last couple months, I created this directory of online arts instruction. So anyone who appears on the map who has indicated that they offer some kind of online arts programming or instruction also appears in this directory of online arts instruction. Um, it's grown a lot, obviously, since the beginning uh, to now. I uh, think, yeah, we started off with like two pages of uh, artists, educators and organizations offering online programming and it's gone now to like 30 pages. Um, anyone who, again, if you apply to appear on the map and you indicate that you give online programming, you'll appear on the directory. And it can be searched in the same way that the map can as well, by discipline and programming. And yeah. so, yeah, that's, that's that. And again, I'm always looking for feedback on how to make things more accessible or um, more user-friendly. Yeah. Great, thank you, Caitlin. Yeah, we're interested now to hear um, any thoughts that you have on the map and uh, if you have any experience with it or if you have any uh, suggestions on how we can continue to develop it and how that would work within your context or um, um, if there's anything that you'd like to see on the map, perhaps. Also interested, as I said before, on um, how else you're reaching out to the public and how else you are kind of spreading the word about the work that you do um, and trying to either get new students or make new partnerships or collaborations uh, with your peers or reach out artists reaching to schools and, and schools looking for artists as well. Um, so if anyone has any, uh, any kind of thoughts on on things that have been working really well for you. Um, we'd love to hear that. Or any, as I said, thoughts on the map. And we're gonna be following up again tomorrow uh, or shortly with a follow-up email um, at where you can also, uh, if you wanna give it a few minutes and, and if you think of something afterwards, uh, you wanna let us know, you'll have the opportunity there as well. Um, um, yeah, um, Jennifer, also I should have really done a bit of a well, we're trying to keep this this meeting to about an hour and a half, so we don't lose everybody bit by bit. But um, but I, I maybe should have canvassed you to see if there was a, uh, any particular platforms that you're using that you're finding useful. And I wanted to say that Caitlin has made uh, you know has included that in our in our resources mm -hmm. section. So if you're looking for platforms that other people are using. There are already quite a few there. And uh, we are also, we did uh, one, we did host one webinar with an, um, Andrew Mercer. And he's a guy with like 25 years experience at teaching online. And he's a wonder. Um, he gave many, many excellent ideas for how to engage students online. And 
he's a wonder because he's like he reminds himself every five minutes to stop talking and ask a question and like always looking for engagement and he's got his like cameras all over the place and many screens because you know it's what he does but it's what everybody does now so um so that's worth checking out it's on our website but but i just wanted to put in a word about the um of any platforms that you're using you could say it now you could type it perhaps in order to save our time um since it's 228 um maybe type it in the uh, in the chat uh, uh so that we can make sure we don't miss any useful platforms sorry what do you mean by platforms uh, so like uh zoom or google meet um google classroom or um what's the one jennifer we're actually we've actually asked andrew mercer to check out a music oh. one music people have the special problem as you music people know of trying to have everybody play together or sing together that there's all these gaps and and so on and there, there, there are platforms that are trying to overcome that and uh, one of them yeah bright uh, bright space is one so um uh, jennifer what, what's the name of the one that andrew is examining for us uh, that one is Jack Trip to deal with uh, Jack latency, Trip. latency issue. You. There's a few of those, so we're looking into um, we're looking into perhaps that one's not in Canada yet, but there are other similar ones that are in Canada, and um, seeing who's using them, and then doing some webinars on those types of things for people who are interested, and partnering with other organizations as well, because um, we we obviously. Uh, deal with all of the art forms and there are specific so there's the Canadian Coalition for for music education and they they are doing some of their own and so we're looking to partner um, as well as kind of fill in the gaps where there isn't a lot so for instance visual arts and, and drama and, and see what people are needing there so that's uh, that's why it's exciting to to hear what everybody's doing and using if anyone has any and also about this chat uh, we will be um, We'll be publishing that as well. So if you missed something in the chat, you can you can revisit it afterwards as well. Um, okay, it's yeah. it's two thirty. So if if you some people have had to leave anyway, and if you have to leave now, fine. I would wouldn't mind keeping it going for maybe ten minutes, if, uh, if for those who can stay, because I'd really like to ask you, how are you? How are you doing? And this is, you know. Um, this is the question that we get very different responses from different provinces. So I don't know how you're going to answer this. Um, people in BC were pretty blase. It's like, yeah, we, we're fine, leave us alone. People in Alberta were, oh my God, they were in you know, real trouble. So, um, so I, I just wondered, uh, yeah, and thank you very much to those of you who have to leave, but just how are you, just a couple of minutes on, how are you faring and your and your clients, your students? Anyone want to comment on that? And thank you everyone for lots of people are adding uh, platforms and programs in the chat. That's great as well. Thank you. Um, yes, Annie. Annie. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, so um, I think uh, our students are uh, generally they, they are doing okay, but uh, to answer one of, uh, um, sorry, I forgot her name. I'm really sorry. Um, she mentioned about if uh, the, the 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 kids are gonna think that online is uh, is gonna replacing the current. It's not going to because I so many parents because I'm I'm the one in the school facing all our parents and so basically I have daily conversation with everyone and checking if they're okay, how they think about the program, and what I learn is everybody. Uh, on one side, they feel uh, the online pro. The, a lot of them they come to school to, to come to our school to learn music, but they don't send their kids to the daily school anymore. They do online program with the daily school, but because we are a private class, so they think it's okay. But uh, the one thing that I often being told is that their kids has this mental. It, it's just very hard for them now because in daytime they just are being restricted in school and they don't get to exercise and then the kids are not really mentally that healthy. And so I was told that some of the kids, uh, they're not as interested as uh, in music even, 
or has the same level of passion for music as they do before. Because before, you know, in the daytime, they play with their friends and they're very happy. And now in the daytime, they're just sitting in front of their computer for the whole day. And after school, they were sent to the music school and learning music. How are you gonna expect a kid who are so happy with his uh, music class? So I think um, generally they're still okay, but I think this model, right now this model, it's not sustainable. It's absolutely not healthy. And um, I'm, I'm very, very worried about my kids from, um, from a, a exposure, like risk exposure to, to COVID-19 perspective. But after the long time struggle, I still decided to send them to school because mental health is so important as well. So I would say uh, everybody, uh, like uh, people around me, we are okay, but we are not great. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Tara. Uh, yeah, th I mean, thanks for asking. <laughs> uh, I really can't speak for thousands of educators in our board, but I would say in general, the mental health is an issue. Um, we are, I think we're in a little bit of a crisis, actually, a mental health crisis for staff and students alike. The teachers are exhausted. The administrators are exhausted. People are looking for answers that aren't available yet. Uh, while they're trying to be innovative and, and creative and where we certainly have leaned in the arts on the OMEA and the OAEA and code and are so grateful for the recommendations and guidelines that were released and for the work that went into that to help somewhat navigate us through this crazy time but I think that, well, I know that we have a bit of a teacher shortage issue right now. I was talking to my friend in the Dufferin Peel Catholic District School Board, and she said that there's currently about 100 elementary classrooms that are teacherless and about 80 secondary teacherless classrooms right now. Um, so, you know, they are, we're, we're scrounging for educators. <laughs> Uh, never mind qualified educators in the particular curriculum that they're going to be assigned. But, and I think that there's also, um, you know, there's definite fear. We, our numbers are, are record high today. There's fear about exposure and um, the, the balancing act between having students present, physically present and within proximity and, and the energy of being within that space versus online forums. And what's the mental health payoff versus the actual physical COVID health payoff? Um, and, and what is valued? What is truly valued? What is, the, what is the Minister of Education expressing to be of greater value? What is Doug Ford expressing to be of greater value? What are educators trying to fight for and sustain? And, and um, you know, it's, it's one thing to talk about the protection of the integrity of the arts as, you know, performative communal um, disciplines. And it's quite another to just think about the survival of trying to keep those, um, those subjects even offered right now in, in very sort of pared down ways in a lot of, in a lot of cases. But um, so I think we, we, are, uh, we, are, we are seeing a lot of exhaustion and, um, and hope, hope for some answers. Um, and some people also really stepping up to the plate in their leadership and their create their creativity and, and sharing through Twitter, sharing through Instagram. Um, the audience has changed. It's not just the classroom audience anymore. Now it's, it's much broader. The audience is, uh, it's exploded actually. And we're looking at different ways of, of displaying and showcasing art. And um, you know these multi-video productions that we're seeing with all the sort of the screens that we're looking at right now with all these collaborative performances. This is a way of outreach and this is a way of, in a sense, promoting arts education and the importance of arts, arts education. I don't think we're at risk of, of losing the importance of music and dance and, and those in-person um, uh, performance opportunities. I, I think that if anything, we're all being reminded of how valuable they are and how much we miss it and how anxious we are to get back to it. The live concerts and the energy that is derived there. So, so the arts educators, I think they, they remember that they're trying to sustain it. They're trying to reinvent and recreate it, but they're also exhausted by the platforms that have been imposed on them right now. Right. Thank you. James Luzio. I'm going to echo everything that Tara said. 
the Ontario College of Teachers put out an unprecedented um, message to everyone who's retired. I'm one of those people. I'm an old lady educator. And um, they asked us all, please desperately come back to the classroom. We have too many classes, please come back. And of course, I'm close to 70 and we're the risk at risk people. We can't really take that risk and go into that classroom suddenly and our families wouldn't have it anyway. Um, I also, just to add, so I don't repeat, the tension for teachers that I also recognize, and uh, Annie, the word that you use is the word everyone I know uses, is what they're doing is unsustainable. They are beyond exhausted and can't keep it up. But the other tension, and there's artists in this room, um, need to understand that we understand how privileged we are, because we still have a salary. I understand that because I'm a retired teacher with a pension. So my neighbors who may be my age don't have that security right now necessarily. So it's very hard to say you're exhausted and that this is unsustainable when somehow income is still coming in. You're working maybe twice, three times as hard because there isn't a structured prep time. Some They had to hire people in school boards called uh, supporters you can have any qualification providing they believe you can get a police check and your job is to go to classrooms so teachers can pee because they don't have a way to leave these people alone oh. either online or in person you can't just walk away from your computer and leave those kids unsupervised so people are being paid 25 dollars an hour and if you don't have work and you need work go to your local school board, go to your local school and say, I can get a police check. I have one as an artist and, and make some money going in and sitting with computer screens or kids while the teacher pees and get something to support you so you can do your amazing work that you, you need to do too. And so uh, I'm also crossed to the dark side at the end of my long history of arts teaching and became a, an administrator, vice principal. And um, they're desperate for administrators, people coming out of the woodwork. I, I was called, I, I resigned from doing any supply work as an administrator with COVID because I couldn't go in and out of schools randomly. We, I just went in and helped when someone was sick. And so they had somebody in the building. And I've been called four or five times to go in. They said, we know you resigned. Could you please think about it? it, it it's that desperate out there. And that's right across the province. So a lot of tensions, a lot of pain, a lot of people working all hours because there's no more structure. So by the time you do your in class, let's imagine a secondary teacher in the morning doing one class, the afternoon they're doing online with their other class if it's quad master, then they finish those two groups and then they have to do this, the uh, asynchronicity. They have to be available for individual kids until Four. And then when they finish that, and only when they finish that, can they attempt to plan and prepare the high technology lessons that they need to deliver the next day. And then after that, they need to mark and evaluate and fill out forms, phone parents, because there used to be prep time. They have to phone parents. You have to phone parents on a screen if the kid comes on, logs on, and then disappears. Because in other words, there's no video, no uh, sound, and they won't respond to you. In that case, it's a safety issue and you need to phone and alert parents. There's just issue after issue that we, we don't even think about. And then the equity one is huge. Kids who are in the virtual school, which has 14,000 students in the TDSB secondary only, secondary virtual school in the TDSB is 14,000 students. And many of them haven't got the technology. They don't have a microphone. So they have a computer, they log in, but they can't speak if they wanted to because they don't have a microphone. Their, 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 their technology doesn't allow it. So I'm just pointing out that, how are we doing, Larry? Terrible. How do we feel about saying that out loud if we have any income because we have friends, colleagues, neighbors starving or struggling or sick with COVID? guilty because how dare we how dare we right right thank you sheila 
Um, I want to just add to what Jane just said, because she did a very um, clear description of what it's like to be a high school teacher in a quad model. I would add to that um, in our school board in the Toronto Catholic T uh, District um, School Board, the, the board decided that teachers could go home. So the experience now, you after the students leave at 11, everyone leaves. So you, you finish your class in the morning, you're face to face, and then prep time isn't really prep time anymore because you're driving home and you're all of those regular things, you know, the, that water cooler experience where, you know, you're talking to your colleagues that has essentially disappeared for, for many of us in schools. We're in our silos and those silos, as Jane mentioned, are, it's just this relentless onslaught of getting the tech ready, planning, answering emails, using whatever platform. So, and we all know about Zoom fatigue. So the, there's, there's physical impacts of that. And then of course there's mental impacts. And one aspect of mental health is that we know from research is detachments necessary in order to maintain uh, equanimity and that has been released from teachers. Uh, another piece uh, just recently, uh, you know, the, the cover of the last Ontario College of Teachers magazine was very offensive and increased that sense of vulnerability. So instead of celebrating the profession, the college has, you know, had this, has this predatory hand, you know, on a, on a, on a, a young person. So suggesting, you know, the um, undermining um, confidence in the profession after a year of, uh, of unprecedented, you know, labor strife with this particular government in Ontario. So I would echo Jane's points. We're not doing well because I think we feel vulnerable. And if you're in a school that's had an outbreak, where my school recently had one last week, there's that um, vulnerability. If you're a teacher who has young children, right, just you, you have to parent and teach under very, very difficult circumstances. So there's layers and layers and layers that are contributing to the sense of isolation and vulnerability uh, in Ontario right now. Right, yeah, and one more with uh, Tamara. Thank you. Sorry, I got caught up in listening to everyone. <laughs> I have forgotten what I was going to say. But um, how am I? Um, I, I, we're, I know we're generally, we're tired and we're frustrated because um, just like everyone else, uh, having to reconceive our art practice and having to reconceive how we engage with the community has been a tremendous amount of work. Uh, it's been a tremendous amount of work from a management perspective. Uh, we, uh, every summer for 26 years, we, we have had an apprenticeship and public space performance program where we have young emerging um, artists of every kind come and join us. So we had to readapt that. So at some point we had 12 people on staff. I, I have someone that I hired as a producer who I've never met in person. <laughs> We've been working together quite brilliantly and incredibly I'm so grateful for her uh, she happened to have the skill set that we need during this particular time um, but management you know it's just it just takes much more time what, what the impact for us is we in the summertime we made a decision it's particularly being, being in the arts where there's so much scarcity while we have been around for 26 years, um, we're, we've been pretty chronically underfunded. And, and I say that, um, I, I'm trying not to, to wear a lot of shame these days, but what that means is I, I get only, my core funding is $55,000 from the Tr Toronto Arts Council and the OAC. 25 of that goes to rent for, my, for our studio. And we create big things we can't not have a studio. And my rent just went up at the beginning of November by another $4,000 per year. So as an artistic director, I make very, very little money. 
um, as a full-time artistic director. Um, uh, so my frustration in that respect has to do with how resources, emergency resources have been allocated. We, we also didn't <laughs> qualify for uh, the, um, the, the wage subsidy because last year was a workshop year for us. And so we don't have revenue from audiences to compare to say that we've lost such a percentage. Mm -hmm. So different arts organizations work in different ways. We, we, not all of us ha have a, um, uh, a, uh, a building uh, and, and have a season, a regular season where we can say, oh, look at all much, all this revenue that we lost. And plus we work in public space. So uh, it's a suggested $10. So, but we still have lost other contracts and stuff and yet we didn't qualify. So my frustration is that there are uh, the cultural uh, emergency federal cultural arts and sports money um, that uh, for the arts and culture money that was distributed only to um, the good biggest portion of it was distributed only to current Canada Council and Heritage Canada um, clients. And we are neither one of those. So we have I have no doubt large organizations are suffering, but the, but I believe right now the who needs arts the most are in the community and not necessarily the people that would normally go to a theater or the opera or uh, any other concert hall. Um, and and yet we we lack those resources to engage more when we are actually set up and have those skills for that engagement. So that's where my frustration lies right now. And I, you know, have to breathe it through and I have to figure out different solutions. And one of, part of that solution is to actually stop and to stop doing more for less or nothing and doing it in kind. And so that's, that's the thing that upsets me is, you know, when we did the third eye, people actually at the end we realized it wasn't, we weren't just doing, I'm sorry, I'm going on here, but we weren't just doing a workshop. People were welcoming, welcoming us into their homes. It was a bit different. It's like, it's like we're doing a meeting right now in Zoom, but in the workshop, it was a bit different. We were being welcomed into homes and we saw isolation and we saw loneliness. And while we were not able to work with the, and present to the large number of audience, audiences that we might in public space, those, those relationships were so vital and so important at that time. And we'd love to do more of it, but we weren't given those resources. So that's why I'm not just frustrated, obviously I'm angry as well. <laughs> so that's, that's kind of where I'm at. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, I think probably it's, oh, and I, I do see Mervy wants to say something. So Mervy, could you be the last and be, I, I'm feeling responsible for letting everyone go at a reasonable time. So. Go ahead, Murphy, and then I think we'll we'll wrap it up. Shall okay, we? You know what? Then, then I'll make it really short because there's so many people who said things that uh, I would I echo, like Tara and Jane and everybody speaking to a lot of points. But I think that over, if I was going to put one word that which I kept hearing from people is that word of exhaustion. Um, mm -hmm. it's it's just um, people are trying really really hard to make a positive experience for children given the restrictions that we need to work within to, for everybody's safety. Um, and I have an amazing creative staff who is wonderful in terms of their teamwork, in terms of how they come up with ideas to try to make uh, that in-person experience as exciting as possible, given how much time goes into disinfection in our day. Like just the COVID protocols alone are, are a full-time job. Mm. Like really like this, I have my door closed right now, but generally the way I look in this building is, oh yeah, right? Like this with my vest outside so you can tell who I am. When there's a sick child, here's my isolation gown. I've got a stack of them because every single day there are kids who come down sick and you can't handle, go near them without an isolation gown and gloves. And 
you know, and we're just trying to keep everybody safe. And I, I feel like it's so, how do you build connection when you feel like you're covered in this, this barrier, but still the staff work so hard because the kids do, did miss seeing other children and being around other people. And so I think they, that that's part of it as well is that mental health piece, which has been already echoed so many times because they do, they do want to have some sense of friendship and, and doing things that are concrete and hands-on and visual and, and all of those sorts of things, which we do through the arts. And, um, but it's, it's exhausting. Except, and I, what I forgot to say, I think earlier was even though we are running all of these programs, like our, some of our music instructors are in-house and some of them were itinerant. So the itinerant ones can't move around from school to school anymore. So they have one home school and then their other schools are supported virtually. So we have some, our strings instructors in-house and virtual for other schools, our steel pen instructors housed somewhere else and virtual for us. So, you know, the instructors through Google Meet while the kids are in front of the pans, you know, with their homeroom teacher who's not a musician, right? And we, we try to be creative, um, but it's exhausting. And even like, I know Jane gave us the stats for the secondary, the elementary I think is close to 80,000 students right now um, that are virtual. In my building alone, I have about a 300 students in person because uh, I'm a middle school and 150 students virtual. And even though they have their virtual teachers, there are all sorts of processes that I still need to support uh, because those virtual principles, um, like basically we have four, quad, four virtual schools and there's 20,000 students in each of those virtual schools. And so those administrators cannot support those teachers in terms of those numbers. So yes, I have my in-person staff, but I have an additional 50, 60 teachers because those 130 students are scattered in virtual classrooms through cyberspace that I also support, who I also get emails from, who also say this child hasn't attended any classes because I'm a contact that I, I knew, know those children from when they were here face to face and I have some relationship with those families. So we all work as educators and artists and we work so hard for, we, we're people, we're, I guess a, I'm a people person, right? So we want to take, to help these families and help each other, but there's so many layers to our, to our days that it's really, um, yeah, the, the safety protocols are really exhausting and I can see it. I, there are all these things that we're still supposed to be doing that are coming as, you know, requests from the board and, and from, the, from the ministry, et cetera, in terms of all sorts of plans and things that we need to, to build. And I feel like I should need to shield my staff from some of those requests because I feel like they're so fragile right now where if I started to demand from them, you know, all sorts of extra pieces and extra information and that it would, it would be too much. Yeah. You know, I'm not, you know, I'm not gonna start asking them to develop, um, you know, collaborative math professional learning groups right now because they, I feel like they're just feeling like they're keeping their, their, their nose above water, right? And so, um, whatever I can do to support them and support the families and support the students. And, you know, and, and I think we all feel like we're just trying to keep the, the boat afloat and we're bailing like mad, you know, to, to, to do that. So, so I, I won't say any more because I know uh, it's the, everybody wants to go, but um, yeah, I just echo a lot of what was already said. Thank you. Well then, on that happy note, we'll we'll come back to you later. It's, it's, so I'm trying to think of the single word. So the word now is exhaustion, and it very obviously, and, and I think the first time that we ran one of these, the, the word would have been, what? <laughs> like what's going on? And then um, the second time was when everybody thought things were sort of settling a bit, 
and it was more like um, getting used to it. So it was sort of like, what? And then getting used to it and now exhaustion. It's sort of like that train seems to be happening. Anyway, I really, really thank you for sharing. It's really good to see you. And, um, and we'll, we'll do another one of these uh, when maybe things are even better. Maybe there's, there are vaccines out or something like that. So stay well, everybody. And thank you. Thanks, everyone. Yeah. Enjoy the rest of your day. Yeah.